Why, hello there, my friend, and welcome to the next episode in the Red Delta Project podcast, where we take a fundamental approach to health and fitness to simplify the whole matter and give you more power, control, and freedom over your healthy lifestyle. As always, I'm Matt Schifferly, founder of the Red Delta Project, and this week's episode is brought to you by over at the fine folks over at the Wisdom app. And the Wisdom app is something that I've been involved with for a little over a month now, and I wanted to tell you all about it because I do weekly talks on it. Basically, it's like a, a TED Talks with audience participation. It's something that you just download right onto your phone. It's a simple app. You tap right onto it. You can search for me, and when you find one of my talks when it's going live, you can literally hop on the call and chat with me directly. So even though I'm doing these live podcasts here on the YouTube channel, when I can get comments and answer questions and stuff, it's your opportunity to interact with me one-on-one -on -one directly for much longer stretches of time. And I do my talks throughout the week, but typically on Friday afternoons. So if you're curious in being able to do that, uh, download the Wisdom app right now. I believe it's only on iOS, uh, but there's a link down below if you want to check out uh, the app for more information. So today's episode is, uh, I had a little bit of trouble figuring out how I wanted to frame it. Like uh, the idea of, uh, is uh, evidence-based research enough or what's missing from diet and exercise science and things like that. And basically what this is, another preview of one of the upcoming books. Yes, I said books in plural. I've got four more in the works right now. But it's a sequel to Fitness Independence. And the more I'm doing research on this sort of topic, the more I'm realizing that there is this massive, huge, gaping hole or void that is missing from almost every diet and exercise approach to helping people get in shape. It's like, I want to lose weight. I want to build muscle, whatever it is. There's still this huge other area that's almost completely being unaddressed and sometimes even fought against to our massive detriment. And what's going on is because of this, it's kind of like trying to build the perfect sports car and you get everything perfectly dialed in, all the algorithms and the computer and everything, but you forget to put fuel in the gas tank. And that's largely what's going on with most programs in our fitness culture, because we have the perfect diet, we've got the perfect science, and we know exactly what we should be doing for losing weight and building muscle, everything's researched to the ninth, and yet they're still falling flat. And this is one of the reasons why I'm excited about this, because the whole point largely of Red Delta Project is to try to figure out how the heck fitness works. Because if we really take an honest look at the track record of helping people lose weight, and build muscle and improve performance or whatever they're trying to do, I still look at the most uh, popular approaches as still massive, colossal failures because most people never get what they want out of fitness. I'm just putting it right out there. Very, very few people achieve the results they want. And even the people who do achieve some results that they do want, they're like, okay, I've made some fairly decent progress, fail to hold on to it for a considerable amount of time. Oh, sure, you've got you know the social media manager and people on social, look at this guy's ripped and everything and people in testimonials and stuff, but that's cherry picked information of the 1% of the 1% of the 1% who are successful. I'm not saying it never works, I'm saying it doesn't work nearly enough. And I'm always looking into, well, why is that? Like if we supposedly know what to do, how come we struggle with it so much? And I think one of the biggest flaws that we have is because we keep turning our attention too much onto focusing entirely on the quote unquote science of health and fitness, the science of nutrition, the science of reps and sets and strength training and bodybuilding and all these other sorts of things in the quote evidence-based world, the logical, factual, like how does the human body work? How does it uh, behave and adapt and stuff, which is all crucially important. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying that it's uh, not uh, uh, good information. Absolutely. If you want to know how to get in shape, you need to know the science behind things of basic nutrition and exercise and all that stuff. That is essential. What I'm telling you today is that it's still 
woefully inadequate by a mile and a half. It's not even close to enough. You could have several PhDs in nutrition and exercise science and kinesiology and win every bodybuilding show for the next 10 years. And still, when it comes to telling people how to get in shape, fall woefully short because it happens all the time. The best experts in the world still have a far greater amount of failure in their track record than success in helping people achieve their results. So why is this? What is going on with that? That's what we're exploring today of what is this massive missing piece. And I'll be, of course, as always, taking your questions and uh, your comments here live as we go about it. Uh, Ronan Thetic's channel is right there. He's saying, hey, how's it going? It's good to have you. Sneakiest is in the house as well. Comment here. Hey, Matt, learning about mind-muscle connection made me more interested in the role of the nervous system in building muscle. Is there a mind eye connection. Ooh, what a good question that you can train to improve vision. This is something I've been actually curious on a little bit myself because my vision finally, I guess, is uh, starting to falter a little bit. I'm 43 now and I'm the only one in my family who's never needed glasses. For years, my mother would be like, you still don't need glasses or contacts? Like, no, mom, my vision's fine. But now I notice like if there's a something in front of my face. I have trouble reading it really close up kind of thing. Uh, so I think this is something that a lot of people have explored in the past, uh, sneakiest, and uh, it might be there to some degree, but the fact that it hasn't become common practice tells me that we still don't really have that or have an understanding of how to do that. Because if there is such a thing, typically that sort of uh, approach would catch on much, to a much greater degree of popularity. And I'm sure, yeah, there's, you know, uh, conspiracy theories out there like, oh, we can improve our vision with this simple exercise three times a day or whatever. It's like, why don't everybody know this? Because the eyeglass companies and Luxottica are keeping it down. But the thing is, conspiracy theories like that just don't hold water very much, especially with the internet. Because if there was some way to develop that, it's as simple as just putting out a YouTube video and a couple of blog posts. And if it starts working, it gains traction and spreads like wildfire. And if it did, that would happen. So it hasn't, so I don't really know. Now, it's not to say it can't happen and that it doesn't exist out there, but I think we still have some research to do. So I'm doubtful, I'm skeptical because of the fact that it's not widespread practice, but uh, I'm hopeful it is, because it kind of makes sense. Like we can condition almost every cell in the body so whatever is that degrading in the eyes that impairs vision and lowers the quality of our vision over time, I would imagine you could condition that stuff. But then again, I'm not an optometrist. I, I wouldn't know, but that would be a very interesting thing. And if it doesn't exist and it can, oh boy, wouldn't that be fun to develop? John, AJ coming on, George Lewis, fantastic. Frederico, hey man, how's it going, Frederico? Let's get to this before we continue our conversation. Hey Matt, good to see you live again. My apologies for being absent last week, by the way, folks. I was up in Winter Park for a work event. I couldn't get to uh, do my podcast. So my, I'm sorry about that. I do try to let you know beforehand when those things pop up. So I dropped the ball on that. I'm sorry. But uh, do you think our fitness quote, level depends on our beliefs and emotions? Boom, shakalaka. Give the man a cigar. He just nailed it right on the bullseye because that is the point what I'm bringing to the table for this episode. Yes, the facts, the science, the research between diet and exercise is important. Yes, absolutely. But it is still woefully inadequate because that what my friend Federico is talking about is the essential component we also need is the human element, the emotional element, the fundamental approach that we talk about here on Red Delta Project is recognizing that your diet and exercise or your health and fitness habits are not about your diet. It's not about your exercise. It's not about your sets and reps and are you lifting with dumbbells or doing calisthenics or any of that sort of thing. Not that that stuff isn't important, but it's not responsible for the results you want. It really isn't. It's about the fundamental principles that govern the processes of mother nature. That's how diet and exercise work and human nature. 
We need that third component. You can have everything about your physiological facts perfectly dialed in, and that would, would be great, and it would work 100% of the time if we were autonomous robots with no emotional co content whatsoever, then all I my job would be so easy. It's like, pff, dude, here we, here we go. Uh, perfect diet all the time, only whole foods, uh, no alcohol, always get eight hours of sleep, work out every single day to the perfect sets and reps, never have any sort of motivation issues, and never have life get in the way. There, I just solved fitness for everybody. But of course, you put that in the real world, and it just goes, blah, right? Every trainer has made this mistake, myself included, where it's like, I know the science between diet and exercise. All you do is eat this diet, and you do this workout, and you do these exercises and stuff, and you get in shape. And then we give it to clients, and a week later, they come back, and they're like, yeah, I kind of didn't really sort of do it like you, you said, you know, and sometimes you get someone who does it. And then a the week later, they're like, eh, you know, holidays coming up and the wife wanted to go out to Burger King and I was hungry. So I said, okay, sure. And we trainers oftentimes were the dumbest <laughs> individual in these relationships. We're like, all right, let me explain it to you. This is why you don't eat fast food. This is why you need to work out at 6 a.m. This is why you need to drink nothing but water and never drink alcohol and stuff. And it's like, yeah, on paper it works, but we're not dealing with robots. You are human, my friend. And if we ignore the basic fundamental principles of human nature, everything you know about the principles of mother nature is still going to basically blow up in your face. Now, here's the thing that really uh, needs to be understood about this, is that there are so many elements in our fitness culture that not only ignore your needs as a human being and the principles of human nature, they even fight the principles of human nature. They tell you to do things even though you don't want to. Oh, you don't want to go to the gym? Force yourself to go to the gym. Oh, you don't want to stick to the diet? You have to make yourself stick to the diet. Oh, you like to eat chocolate and drink Starbucks Mako Frappo Latto Chinos? Tough shit, sweetheart. You got to and make yourself do it or else you're not strong and worthy of the gains you want. This is complete, utter nonsense. Complete nonsense. Now, humans, we can force ourselves to ignore our primal human natures for periods of time. Absolutely, everyone can, but it's not something we can infinitely do. We have a finite capacity to do these things. And eventually, just like the principles of mother nature, the principles of human nature always win out. We cannot, we can kind of push them away a little bit, but eventually they will win. And like other things in a fundamental approach to fitness, you either align yourself with the principles of nature that are in charge, or you struggle and you will fail. It's we're not in charge. Mother nature's in charge and the principles of human nature are in charge. Willpower, self-control, discipline, all these things are important, but you can't override our basic human nature. And we'll get into a little bit more of that, but that's the first lesson is we are fundamentally emotional creatures, not logical. We cannot, you know, to quote, what was the guy from The Martian? Matt Damon played him. I forget the, the character's name. We can't science the shit out of this sucker, okay? We can't science our way into a healthier body if we don't have those emotional components in place as well. Because you can have all the science dialed in perfectly, but boy, if you don't have the, those emotional components in place, you're screwed. You're 100%... D-O-A, my friend. So Federico, thank you for kicking that one off. Nicholas, how's it going, my friend? Coming on saying, hey, Matt, when trying to train for one arm pull-up reps, how to stop my body twisting after <clears throat> each rep? Excuse me. It's hard to rep out when the body spins after each one arm pull-up. So you may not want to even prevent this, uh, Nicholas. Um, I don't do the, the full one arm pull-up, but I do it with primarily most of my weight, like about 80% of my weight on one arm. And when I come down, I twist away a little bit. And when I come up, I twist towards it. You have some internal rotation, which makes sense because your lats, one of your biggest muscles responsible in a pull-up motion, is an internal rotator. Actually, I got that backwards. It's external rotation. So you have internal rotation as you're going down, external as you're coming up. Excuse me, I'm thinking of internal like I'm turning my body inwards, but it's actually external 
on the arm. <clears throat> so I don't think you necessarily want to or need to prevent uh, the rotation period. You probably actually want it to some degree. Uh, one of the videos I posted on the Red Delta Project Advent Calendar, because it is the month of December and every day I post a new workout video, a little mi mini micro workout, I talked about taking advantage of that rotation and how you can use it to further build up your biceps and your back with your pulling exercises. So if I were you, I wouldn't try to prevent it, but just control it. So you're not like turning like away from your arm necessarily, but keeping the rotation to roughly about maybe 90 degrees or 45 degrees or so and controlling that rotation. Because I think you're actually going to be better off with the rotation than not having it. That's what I would do uh, uh, with that. <clears throat> Andy Keen coming on. Hey, Matt, I've been following convict conditioning and I'm now on step six, close pushups. My favorites. I love those. I can get the... Uh, get the five rep beginning standard, but it hurts my shoulders and uh, when index fingers touch after uh, exercise. So I would look at and take a video of your shoulders. What are they doing at the bottom of those? So when you were doing close grip stuff, there is much more demand that our shoulders get packed down and back all the more, especially at the bottom of the pushup. Now, my lesson that I've learned this year and I've observed from a lot of people is a lot of people don't have nearly enough scapular movement with push-ups. You know, when you do a row, you have a lot of scapular motion, or at least you should. You should have equal amounts of that scapular motion when you're doing push-ups. So at the top, full protraction. When you come down, your shoulders should be like way down and back, and that should loosen up some of the tension you're feeling in the shoulders and help with that. Start warming up with cat cows, and the classic cat cow exercise we have in the grind style calisthenics program to open up those shoulders, get them moving a lot, and uh, see if that can help you over time. But anyway, uh, continuing along our conversation. So now understanding the fundamental principles of mother nature is of course a rabbit hole that you could spend you know, 10, 20 lifetimes trying to explain. I'm certainly not coming on here saying that, oh, I understand how human beings work. I'm like, are you kidding me? I don't even understand how I work. Like, it's impossible to really have a full formed understanding of what makes us humans tick. Probably never will. But one of the most general aspects that we can kind of start to apply is, as I was alluding to earlier, is that we humans are fundamentally emotional creatures. And you can see, especially now these days, uh, with a lot of the divisiveness in societies and stuff on, uh, you know, various belief systems, because Frederico talked about beliefs. And human beliefs are not formed by fact and logic, they're formed by beliefs. And I've, as I've mentioned in the past, like, I don't care what you know about donuts. I don't care about the facts you understand about nutrition. Someone walks into the office with a box of donuts, how you feel on an emotional level about those donuts is what's going to determine if you eat those donuts or not. Your emotional state will control your, your mental and therefore also your physiological state. So we are, I hesitate to use the word slaves, but we are controlled by our own emotional. And if some one or thing, which is unfortunate these days, can manipulate you on an emotional level, they have control over you. It's that simple. If a government, if an media source, if that's how propaganda works, you know, if something can get you to feel a certain way, they've got you. They have your will in their hands. And unfortunately, with a lot of things like on social media and stuff like that, they've gotten really damn good at it because they figured it out. Oh, if I post this content, I can make people pissed off. Oh, if I post this kind of content, it's getting them riled up and antagonistic about whatever they want you to be fed up and riled about, you know, the other political party, the other race, the other uh, religion, the other people over there, whatever, you know, you see a lot of this in the social construct, but it works the same exact thing in fitness. If I can get you to feel a certain way about sugar, then I've just controlled every decision you make about sugar. You know, what you eat, how you eat, when you eat it, I've got full control over you. If I can get you to feel a certain way about eating meat, eating vegetables, uh, so forth. And that's how we've got so many of these seemingly conflicting ideas. And people are walking around going, how can people be so stupid that they've got this belief? The answer is intelligence has nothing to do with it whatsoever because it's not about what they know. And you know this. 
if, because you take someone with a weird um, belief system, you present them facts, it doesn't do any good whatsoever. You might as well just go up into them and go, and it does exactly the same thing. Because of course, those beliefs aren't there because of what's in the head, it's what's in the heart. I've got a funny story to share with you about that, but let's get to a couple more of these questions here. Uh, Bronchio, is bodybuilding bad for the heart regardless of steroids or not? I ask because of the pressure a bodybuilder puts in their heart daily lifting. I don't think it's necessarily bad at all. Um, you know, back, but it is a good question because, you know, back in the day, they used to call heart attacks and angina and stuff. They used to call it athlete's heart legitimately. So that's what they, they thought that athletics and exercise of any kind was bad for the heart. And it's kind of almost a little bit of a misnomer because when we talk about conditioning the heart and the lungs and the cardiovascular system, we focus on the heart, we focus on the lungs and stuff, but really our cardiovascular system, it, you know, cardiovascular, we're missing the other part. It's your blood, it's your arteries, it's your capillaries, it's your oxygen exchange. It's literally every cell in your body. It's your ability to use oxygen, which is throughout your entire body. And a lot of times we mistakenly look at the condition and the health of the heart or the lungs as actually the condition of the rest of your system. So sometimes when it comes down to uh, a deconditioning of the ability to uh, have endurance with uh, the ability to use our muscles in a certain way, then that can sometimes be perceived as a negative. But overall, I would say no. I would hazard to guess that a lot of the quote, you know, negative things that people attribute to the heart with uh, from bodybuilding, that's not the exercise. Uh, you alluded to the steroids, that can be very much attributed to it. Also, the overeating and the diet. Lots of times in bodybuilding, overeating, con excessive consumption and stuff are part of the culture. And that excessive consumption of food can sometimes be detrimental to the cardiovascular function of the body as a whole, especially when people are like, I'm bulking. Well, I've you know, been bulking for it, like five years. And it's like, dude, <laughs> I, I think you've done bulking <laughs> on that one. So I think it's more extraneous things that are going to, not the actual exercise. I don't necessarily think the bodybuilding style programs are to blame for that. If anything, it's probably more heart healthy. <clears throat> Excuse me, was already. Hey Matt, what's your opinion on conjugate concurrent periodization approach to getting a stronger way to pull up something Alpha Destiny preaches? I like anything that takes more than a singular approach to training. So a lot of times people get again caught up in like, okay, so should I do this type of periodization? Should I do the conjugate method from like West Side Barbell? Should I do it this way? Like, I don't really think it matters, to be honest with you. I think if you're like, okay, I'm gonna train this way higher reps, faster speed uh, kind of approach for a while. And then I'm going to go heavier for a while and slower. And then I'm going to go this other way. I think the more variety we expose our muscles to, the more we can create a complete holistic stimulus to improve our overall development. Because a lot of times when people get stuck in plateaus, it's because they've bought into the idea, again, coming from an emotional place because of how they feel about doing things a certain way, then they think, okay, this is the one way I'm supposed to train and they don't broaden their horizons. So any sort of approach where people like train this way for a while and then mix in this other way and this other approach and stuff, if it's all going towards the same basic movement pattern, like in this case, the pulling action, I think it can only help you. I think it's a very good way, good for probably your overall health as well. And it's uh, one of those things to, uh, just kind of keep an eye on and keeps the training from getting stale as well. How you doing, John? I am now happy with the results. Uh, do I still need progressive overlay to maintain? Not at all. Uh, just keep doing what you're doing. In fact, you probably need a lot less than what you may believe. It, to maintain what we have, it usually requires less um, volume. Uh, than, than we usually have. So if let's say, for example, you've been doing a program where you're working out pull-ups three times a week, uh, very heavy weighted sets kind of thing, probably like maybe even once a week uh, with a couple hard sets of those weighted ones, maybe all that you need to maintain. It takes a lot less to maintain uh, than to actually grow. Think of like in school when you were learning a lesson, like your multiplication tables. It took a lot of hard work and effort to learn those multiplication tables. But you know, when was the last time you needed to do those aside from basic math 
on a daily basis. And you probably still know, you know, nine times nine is 81. You know, I didn't need to practice that. I didn't need to do daily work for that. It's just now it's in there. It's kind of the same thing with fitness. Yes, you need to be able to have uh, some degree of practice to maintain because if you don't use it, you lose it, but you probably don't need to use it nearly as much. Let's see. Okay, so going back to our conversation, um, I'm actually drawing a bit of a blank on where I left off, but the point is we're driven by our emotions. The analogy I've always used is our muscles are like the wheels of a car and our brain and nervous system is the engine. That's what's driving it. You've got to develop your engine to make your wheels move better and faster. But our emotional state is our fuel. You can have the best wheels, the best engine and stuff, but you got no fuel, nothing happens, right? So our emotional state is our fuel. And we typically are more susceptible towards any sort of belief patterns. We're going to pick up something, whatever we want to believe. So a case example, again, going into society here in the United States, like we had a very uh, hard contested election here last year, right? Trump versus Biden. And afterwards, a lot of reports and people were like, okay, the election was stolen. It was rigged and stuff like that. And I went to a Christmas party uh, shortly afterwards. And there were a lot of people there who were still on the bandwagon of everyone. You know, the election was clearly stolen. It was clearly rigged, yada, yada, yada. And it, it's a very fascinating thing for me to observe uh, because it's funny how everybody who wanted Trump to win who had a, a, the desire to see Trump win, everyone who believes the election was stolen also wanted Trump to win. You, know, you don't have many people who are like, I hated Trump, he was worse, he was terrible, but I still think the election was a fraud. Almost never happens. I'm sure there's probably some examples out there or something, but it almost never happens. Like you wanted him to win because your emotional state was in that regard. Then when someone's like, hey, I think the election was stolen, take a look at these infographics or whatever. Boom, you're more susceptible towards that belief. Now, it's a funny thing about human nature where we have a belief, our emotions guide us in that direction, but then our brain picks up information to substantiate it. And that makes us think, no, it's based on logic. It's based on facts. It's like bullshit. It's based on what you feel. Same thing on the other side. They wanted the other guy to win. So they were like, of course it wasn't stolen. We want it fair and stir kind of thing. Again, governed by how you feel. It's not based on facts. It's not based on logic. It's based on how we feel. And then the facts and the logic fall after that. So going back into fitness sort of thing, the people who are able to stick to a good habit and routine or whatever, they've already, for whatever reason, have an emotional setting that's in alignment with that behavior. So if I say to someone, okay, don't drink, you know, if you want to lose weight, no alcohol, if they've already got an emotional alignment with not drinking, they're like, yeah, I, I don't feel good drinking. You know, my daddy was an alcoholic and it was really bad growing up with him and everything like that. I don't like alcohol. Boom. If I say don't drink, you already have an emotional orientation towards that behavior. It's going to be pretty easy for you to do it. Right? Now, on the other hand, if you had an experience in college where you're like, I was a social quiet kid, but boy, you get some alcohol in me and I can talk to any girl and I'm popular and I'm funny and people love me and I love to drink and I love the, the flavor of it and everything. If you have such a positive emotional alignment with alcohol, telling you not to drink is like going to be like pulling teeth and I can pull up all the information. You know, alcohol causes X number of deaths every year and this is what it does to your liver and other. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all because if I can't influence how you feel about it, Nothing happens. And it's the same thing with exercise, with diet and everything. If we can't change how we feel on a fundamental level, being able to change our behaviors and abilities to get what we want is a serious uphill battle, huge uphill battle, which is why we don't want to ignore this emotional component of fitness. Because if we do, we're just always going to be like beating our head against the wall and know that's not how I lost my hair because I ride my bike so fast, the wind just took it right off. But we want to recognize this emotional component and not ignore it and not fight it and not be like, doesn't matter how you feel, facts are facts. Yeah, the, like there's a t-shirt going around. I see people wearing it. It's like science doesn't care how you feel or something like that, or facts don't care how you feel like to, as a way to kind of downplay the importance of feelings and emotions. But the ironic thing is that person bought that shirt because of how it made them feel. <laughs> 
<laughs> they bought it for emotional reasons. They paid money that they worked very hard for to put that shirt on and wear it out in public to make that statement based on how it feels. Irony of ironies. I want to get that shirt just for that reason. But we want to recognize that this is what's driving the bus is our emotional content and making sure it's in alignment. And so I'll talk a practical application here in a little bit, but let's get to some more questions. Down in Dirty 97. Hey, the year I graduated high school. Fantastic. Hey, I got a question. In your opinion, which isn't worth much, trust me, what would be the best way for someone to drop weight to prepare for the military? Ah, I'm a powerlifter and need to drop. Whoa, yeah, I want the, the lean cut look. So uh, first off is make sure you're getting your diet to a normal place. Okay, so don't make changes if things are all over the place with your diet uh, and your activity level. If you're like, one day I'm fasting, the next day I'm eating like five cheeseburgers or something like that because I got a, you know, I just did a hard workout or something. You don't want your diet to be all over the place. Get to a place where it's fairly consistent from day to day. Uh, you know, if nothing else, just focus on the three square meals a day. You know, the old Paul Wade convict conditioning approach, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and try to avoid the snacks. And once you've got your diet established, whatever it is, I don't, I don't really care what you eat, just get it normal, then cut back so you know you're eating less. Because that's the important thing. It's like, well, how much should I eat? I don't care, less, just less of whatever normal is. And we need to know what normal is first. So get your portion control relatively the same. Like every morning, okay, I have like five eggs and three strips of bacon or a cup of coffee, whatever kind of thing. It's like, okay, now I know that's normal. Okay, then let's cut out the bacon and just do the eggs. So that way you don't need to count calories. You don't need to have fitness pal and my zone and trackers and all that sort of thing. You just need to know what is normal and then less than normal. Same thing with your physical activity level. Power lifter, awesome, great. So I'm, read, I'm guessing you already have a routine. And then what you can do if time and energy allows, add in a little bit more physical activity into that routine. It can be anything you want. It doesn't need to be cardio. It doesn't need to be more sets and reps. It can literally, you burn calories doing anything. So just add whatever the heck you want. I'm a big fan of walking myself, uh, which may complement the uh, nervous system recovery from your heavy power lifting. Uh, activities. So that's what I would do first is make sure your activity and your diet's normal and then bring your diet down and your activity level up to whatever degree that you can sustain and uh, we'll go from there. <clears throat> Coming on back again, I don't like gym partners because they're stuck in their ways. Oh, I hear that. I had a friend who just loves machines. I like compound movements. Have you ever had a bad gym partner in your life? Um, not a whole lot. We personal trainers typically don't have a lot of gym partners because we work with people exercising all day long. So when we, uh, it's time for our workouts, the last thing we want is to be around people because we're around people working out all day long. And hell, that's why a lot of gym, uh, a lot of personal trainers will actually have memberships at different gyms. It's like, you get a free membership here. Why are you buying a gym membership across town? It's like, because I don't want to be here <laughs> as much as I need to. I need to go somewhere else where no one knows me and people leave me alone kind of thing. Um, but no, I haven't really had bad gym partners. I had some good ones. I had a guy named Jerome that we used to do playground workouts with all the time. And man, those were fantastic. Uh, Sam Pelletier, same thing. I mean, we had these fantastic workouts because we'd just be bouncing ideas. And it wasn't like a strict workout. It was more of just playfulness. And I think that's what you want with a good gym partner is, again, on that emotional level, someone you resonate with on the same emotional vibe. It's like, what do you enjoy doing? What are you enjoying out of the workout? And if you're two are in alignment, you got a good partner. But if not, ditch them. They're holding you back. And you're holding them back, too, because you're not allowing them to do their thing as well. All right. <clears throat> asking Michael asking, when is the new book coming out? Going to be a while, my friend, going to be some time. So I've got four new books planned. Um, the one that the big one that I've been talking about over the past couple of months, unfortunately, is really stalled uh, because it's the one on my lessons on fundamental fitness. But um, I've tried writing it several times over the past five months or so, and I just can't get the thing to have any traction when I'm writing it, which tells me uh, that I don't understand the, the subject material nearly as, as well. You know, understanding the information is one thing, understanding it well enough to teach and write about it is a whole nother thing. You got to know it and understand it on a different level. And my experience has been that if you feel like you're passing a kidney stone to put something out there and you're kind of forcing it, because it, usually when you understand something well, it just, it just comes 
write out. It's so easy to write about. Uh, but if you're, if it's not happening, it's the universe telling me I don't understand it as well as I think I do. I need to let it incubate a little bit. So right now I'm working on uh, the second book in the Grind Style Calisthenics series. Actually, that's the third one. Grind Style Calisthenics, Overcoming Isometrics was number two. This one is on suspension training and um, suspension calisthenics. Hopefully I'll get that one out by the end of January. <clears throat> but um, yeah, so what are we talking about with emotional states? Because one of the problems with the emotional take on things is that the science side of things is really easy to get a handle on, right? The, the evidence-based stuff, the fundamental principles of mother nature, calories in, calories out, sets and reps, quantifiable numbers, formulas, spreadsheets. We get a good handle on it, right? And then you go with the feely, touchy, feely, soft and stuff, subjectiveness. And it's like, yeah, we don't have any firm footing on it. Like it's not something we can science our way out of to a large degree. Yeah, there's, you know, of course, there's social scientists and there's emotional scientists and stuff, but it's not nearly as objective and concrete to deal with, which is why a lot of people avoid it. But here's a couple of things that we can do first is uh, the first thing is recognizing the importance of our emotional content. Okay? How you feel is incredibly important. That's, I'll just put it there as a full stop. Okay? It's not trivial. Uh, if you feel in a negative way towards things, that's not to be ignored. Okay? I know people for years who hate going to the gym. And they don't like going to the gym. They don't like anything about it. They don't like the people there and everything. And every year they try to force themselves to go to the gym. And I'm just like, why? If there's something about diet and exercise or some part of it that you don't like emotionally, right? Don't ignore that. Work with it. Don't force yourself. There's so many messages in our fitness culture that are telling you to force things through to make yourself do what you don't want to do. It doesn't matter if you don't like doing it, do it anyway kind of thing. Yes, there's a time and a place for that. But by and large, for most people, most of the time, that's not the way it works. Fitness in general should be a positive, rewarding, dare I say, even pleasurable experience. It should feel good. It should be emotionally rewarding, not emotionally draining. And if something's draining, especially chronically, then something's wrong and it needs to be addressed. It's not something to just bury down and be like, shut up emotions, I'm ignoring you kind of thing, which is very common here in our American culture, especially for us guys. We're not supposed to have a lot of emotional, touchy-feely stuff going on, but and you're literally ignoring the gaslight on your dashboard saying, hey, I need fuel. And you're like, shut up, car, keep going. That's literally what you're doing. And it's just going to get worse. So we need to recognize the importance of emotions, listen to how we feel about things, and then address it head on. Make changes because sometimes we should make changes. And I've even had people say like, so Matt, let me get this straight. When it comes to getting strength, you just need resistance against a tension chain. Like, yeah, I don't care what exercise you do. I honestly don't think it matters. You know, free weights, calisthenics, dumbbells, machines, whatever. I, don't, I really don't think it is important. It's like, so... I do calisthenics purely because I, how I feel about it. I do calisthenics, not because any science or evidence-based fact or anything. I do it purely just because hey, I like doing it. It makes me feel good. That's what you're basing it off of? Damn straight. Hell yes, that's what I'm basing it off of. Because in many cases, that's the most important thing to base it off of. You know, I don't do barbell work. I just don't, barbell's never been my thing. I've tried to make it my thing. I spent years trying to understand and really dial it in, but it just never felt like my thing. You know, I, that's the best way I can describe it. Same thing with running. Like, yeah, running is not my thing. I'll ride my mountain bike for hours. I love riding mountain bike. I love doing it. So let me get this straight. You ride your mountain bike purely just because you, it's fun that that's why you do it. That's the only reason. Damn straight because it's an emotional alignment with me. And if it's an emotional alignment, it's gonna be a hell of a lot more effective. Good question, good point here. Worst personal trainer that I've seen in gyms, when they push someone too hard past their limits too early. Amen, brother. Almost like it's their workout, not their clients. Oh, that's such a good point. That's, yeah, you know, we, I think we all make that mistake. I used to make that mistake too. 
until I understood that your ability to get results doesn't depend on how hard you work. <laughs> you know, when I started to finally understand the fundamental approach to fitness, I'm like, wait a minute, it's not about how hard I'm working. You can work your ass off. You can work yourself to within an inch of your life, every single workout and still go nowhere from where you are right now because it's progression that gets us results. So that's why I tell people, and it kind of takes the pressure off them a little bit. Like, I don't care how hard you're working out here. I don't care how many push-ups you do. All I want is doing something a little tiny better than before, you know, and they go and they do their workout and, you know, maybe they get deeper in the push-ups or maybe they get a couple more reps. I'm like, great, awesome, high five, a win for the day today. And they're like, but I didn't get destroyed, but I can lift my arms afterwards. I'm like, I don't care. doesn't matter. It's better than before. And you get results from doing better, not by how hard you push which is a shame for why some of those trainers will push themselves so hard initially, because when you're initially training, the ability to move the needle with some progression initially is the easiest thing to do. <laughs> like, yeah, sure, when you've been training 10 years and you're near the edges of your potential, it's gonna take blood, sweat, and tears to keep the needle moving forward, absolutely. But when you're a beginner, it's like you don't need to have, be bleeding from your eyes with intensity and fatigue and so sore you can't walk the next day to make that happen. You just need to be better than before. And that's relatively easy to do and you don't need to crush yourself. Let's see, what else we got here? <clears throat> uh, so there's two things that I always tell people when it comes to uh, emotional content because we can go in a million different directions, but there's two ways to look at this. Usually when we have an, a negative emotional reaction or alignment with something, it's one of two areas, uh, either in the method you're using, like the diet or the exercise program or whatever, it's in the method you're using, or there's a negative emotional alignment with your objectives, your goals. That can be really, really tough. So the first thing is the emotional alignment to the method. That's pretty easy to overcome uh, right off the bat because it's easy to find. You just do something else. You know, like going to a gym, great. Let's get some dumbbells and set up a pull-up bar in your apartment. Boom, home gym, great. And that's very apparent because if you're like, I just don't like going to the gym. I just don't like barbell. I just don't like uh, kale or whatever. You, The second you stop doing that method and you do something else, that negative emotional pull just evaporates. It's gone. And it's like, oh, this is way better. Yeah, this is fun. Okay, great. Problem solved, real quick and easy. And that's why understanding the fundamental principles of mother nature are so important because our fitness culture is very method based and it tells you you need to do it this way you need to exercise this way and do this kind of training and this kind of diet and eat this way and stuff and it's not at all true you know there isn't a single uh, goal that is method dependent unless your goal is the actual method right if you want to run a marathon you have to be able to run 26.2 miles and two miles miles an hour <laughs> i wish but if your goal isn't to get good at a particular method, there's no method that's actually required. You know, if you, that's why I tell clients all the time, I'm like, dude, I got a million ways of helping you lose weight and build muscle and stuff. So if you don't want to do it this way, just tell me, we don't have to do it. I got 20 billion other options for you. We'll find one that you like. If you go into a buffet and you're like, I need protein, but I hate seafood. Why are you loading up your plate with salmon and crab legs? Like there's a ton of other options. Don't do things you don't like to do. There's no good reason to. It's just coming at an emotional cost that doesn't need to be there. So that's easy is as long as you got those fundamental principles going on, calories in, calories out, stimulus and adaptation, use whatever method you like. If you don't like a method, there's no good reason to do it. Just do something else. And that solves that problem. But sometimes there is a negative emotional alignment between where you are and your goal. And that's a much harder nut to crack. But let's get to a couple more questions on here that I may have missed. Um, <clears throat> Calvary, no, I feel like uh, they make training so complicated. Absolutely. The most important things are a good range of motion, uh, training failure, uh, form and recovery. All you need to know, I would even uh, argue that in most cases, none of, none of those are important either. Like, do you need full range? Not at all. I'm a big range of motion guy. I think you get more from good range, but you certainly don't need it. Train to failure, again, certainly don't need it. Uh, in fact, I've always told people, like, don't worry about training to failure because I think most people never reach it. Uh, I think it's more subjective. But yeah, pushing yourself, good form, good recovery. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not complicated, but it is when you get under 
uh, under the hood, as it were. <laughs> it's because like, it's like driving a car. Dude, I push your foot on the gas, it goes. Hey, it's simple. It's not complicated. Yeah, but when you understand how an engine works, it gets complicated real, real quickly. Um, <clears throat> so going back onto uh, the emotional alignment with a result. Now, here's the thing. A lot of times, it's not about how we feel about fitness or diet or exercise. It's a lot of it is how we feel about ourselves, you know, our own emotional projections about ourselves. Now, here's here's a story. Um, I remember there was I used to hate exercise largely because I always imagined the type of person that liked exercise. I thought the type of person who likes exercise has no life. Uh, they're, you know, the dumb you know, brainless, muscled up jock. And all they, they're very narcissistic, right? They're not intellectual sort of thing. And I didn't think, I didn't fit that, that like, that's not me. That's what people tell me all the time when they're like, I want to get in shape. And I'm like, well, we could do this. And, you know, maybe we'll do this little thing and start giving them ideas because like you can never turn off the coach in me. And they're like, I'm not that kind of person. I'm not that kind of person. I'm not that kind of person, right? Because emotionally, they feel a certain way about themselves and they feel a certain way about the type of person who has those objectives. And there's an emotional disconnect between the two of them. And it's like, okay, that's that kind of person. I'm this kind of person. Nope, not going to happen. So even if they try to force themselves to adopt some of those behaviors, you know, like if uh, bodybuilders are stupid, idiot, narcissistic jerks, right? Here, have a protein shake. Ugh, protein shake, bodybuilders drink protein shakes. Yeah, so does like anybody else because it's just a freaking protein shake, you know, kind of thing. But if I have an emotional relationship with that, I'm going to be like, Ugh, protein shake, gross, no way kind of thing. But, you know, somehow along my journey, I flipped a bit of a switch and the things I hated, I learned to love because I became more of an emotionally positive perspective on those things like bike racers and eh, skinny you know spandex uh, sweaty gross uh, guys who spend way too much on a bicycle those guys are idiots kind of thing and then i got into mountain bike racing which was kind of a workaround kind of thing because it wasn't like tour de france cycling it was mountain biking you know blood sweat and gears kind of thing and then i was like well okay well get on a road bike for conditioning for that. And before I knew it, I was a full-fledged <laughs> cyclist, you know, spandex and everything, a skinny little guy going up mountains at 150 pounds. I'm like, how the hell did I turn into the thing I hated? The answer is I realized the thing I hated, I misunderstood. I'm like, dude, these guys are badasses. Like the amount of pain and suffering they put themselves through and stuff. Maybe, I'm not a badass. Maybe I could become more of a badass if I put myself through that. So then I would go do the training and I'm like, I'm a badass. I rode hundred miles today. Yeah. And I had a positive emotional orientation to that thing. And suddenly I went from someone who was like cycling is stupid to absolutely obsessed with it. So it's a, it's a tough thing to do, but at least getting real with ourselves of how do I feel about myself? How do I feel about the kind of person I am or perceive of myself versus the kind of person that gets that sort of thing. Because again, with building muscle, like hey, I'm only dumb bodybuilding, narcissistic jerks lift weights and stuff. But then after school, you know, I got some dumbbells, started lifting. I'm like, this feels really good, you know, kind of thing. And oh, I'm starting to build some muscle. This feels, feels really good. And then I actually had some friends who were kind of on the bodybuilder-ish aspect. I'm like, these guys are so nice. Like, they're not jerks at all. Oh my gosh, this is great. And they'd be like, hey, man, you want to work in? I'm like, yeah, sure. And then, wow, these guys are really smart too. Like, this guy's got a PhD in kinesiology. I can't even spell kinesiology kind of thing. And my orientation switched. My How I felt about it changed. And once it went to positive, I'm like, I want to be more like these guys. And boy, let me tell you, when your emotional orientation towards the methods and what you're trying to achieve switches from negative to positive, try not getting results. <laughs> try not being motivated. It's a total game changer. And again, it has nothing to do with learning anything, with knowing different stuff, finding the right program or diet. It's about changing how you feel about it. And it's like an avalanche just going down the mountain. You just, everything just comes right along. Andy Keene talking here. Hey, Matt, do you take rest days? What do your rest days look like? No, no rest days. 
I'm always changing, always adapting. Um, so for those who uh, haven't really been following much, I don't have any sort of regular weekly routine. I literally, every day I'm like, I don't know what feels like working today. You know, yesterday I jumped up on a pull-up bar. I'm like, let's get some pull-ups in. And it was like really cracky and stiff and my muscles were tired. I'm like, mm, nope, not pull chain today. That's not quite feeling quite good. I'm not doing that today, but I did do my legs. And I was like, oh, legs are feeling good. Okay, legs. So I'm always doing something to some degree. It's very freestyle, very free form kind of thing. And uh, yeah, I probably have some days where I don't do any very regimented training, but I mean, I'm always practicing Taekwondo to some degree. I'm always, uh, you know, practicing isometrics to some degree, even as I'm coaching class, I'll just kind of stretch out a little bit, Urgh, get the back engaged. Okay. That feels good. So I'm always training to some degree, most every single day. I never have a day off. Some days are just harder than others. George Lewis, Matt, saw your video about inverted rows. Can I develop a different back with only that exercise or decent sorry different back uh, what the heck's different back decent back with only that exercise i can't do pull-ups because i train at home uh, yeah i think rows i mean fundamentally uh you know horizontal pull vertical pull are the same thing you have elbow flexion you have shoulder extension so fundamentally it shouldn't really feel that different and i think yeah you could definitely develop a pretty good, decent back with those sorts of things. And keep in mind, you can progress those too. Because some people for maybe shoulder injuries or like a broken clav clavicle or something, I know a guy with a broken clavicle, he can't bring his arms overhead. It's like, it's just not in the wheelhouse to do vertical motions like that. Sure, don't worry about it. Rows are a fantastic thing and there's lots of ways you can progress them. It's fantastic. Yeah, Leo uh, saying 100 miles a day on a bicycle is badass. We've done it. A few times. Yeah, it is tough. It's funny though, because there are times I've done it and afterwards I'm like, dude, I could still totally keep riding. Like that wasn't that hard. And other times I've done it and it's just brought me within an inch of my life. Depends a lot on your environment too. Like if you're riding uh, fairly flat areas like I used to do um, here in Denver, like you go east, it's flat, west, it's Rockies. So I've ridden in the Rockies and even 50 miles in the Rockies is tough. I did a 50 mile mountain bike ride uh, from Copper to Vail uh, this year, earlier this year. And that was the hardest thing I'd ever done on a bike. It was over 12 hours and 90 degree heat. Um, I was literally like begging strangers for water and stuff kind of situation. So it really depends a lot on your terrain. But yeah, 100 miles, that's not easy no matter how you slice it. Box Fit Channel, different workouts for different ages. The older you get, the more pounding your body uh, on your body is not great for you. 53 years old for me now, calisthenics, swimming, walking does the job. Absolutely. So that's another thing to pay attention. I'm glad you mentioned that is, of course, feelings change. You feel how we feel about ourselves and our exercise and stuff, it changes. And if we force ourselves to stay in a dogmatic program and our feelings have changed, that can be problematic too. So like I used to be a full on hardcore bike racer. Bike racing, especially mountain bike racing, was all I thought about, cared about. That was the basis of my fitness. You know, back in college, I was a bike racer. I only did two things that entire college career. I raced my mountain bike and I waited to race my mountain bike. I went to class and did stuff while I was waiting. But that was my entire college career. That's all I cared about. But how I felt about mountain bike racing has changed over the years. I still do the occasional race once in a while. I did the Firecracker 50 in Breckenridge this past year and stuff. And it's like, yeah, it's fun, but how I feel about it has changed. Now, if I forced myself to still race at that level and be competitive like that, I wouldn't like it anymore. It wouldn't be fun for me. I would be stressed out and beating myself up on an emotional level because it's like, you have to race. I don't really feel like it, but I have to race. Okay, fine kind of thing. If I was forcing myself, then I would be out of alignment. But now I'm like, yeah. I'm not a bike racer anymore. I'm just a guy who races his mountain bike on occasion, but I still like mountain biking. I still ride it. Okay, great. That's how I feel. And I change and modify as I get older, as my experiences change. You know, when I started lifting weights and I was like, oh, I like building muscle. Well, muscle and bike racing don't exactly go hand in hand. Every gram of muscle you build, especially on your upper body, is going to slow you down on the bike. And I was like, no, it won't. It won't. Yeah, it did. <laughs> it really slowed me down. But so then it came down to, well, where's your heart lie? More in being fast on the bike or building up 
bigger biceps. I'm like, yeah, I kind of want to build the bigger biceps more. Okay, there you go. But don't get pissed off that your race times are getting slower because you got to make a choice. I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm cool with that. <clears throat> uh, hey, man, I'm in, in a, I'm on a education studying fitness and health here in Switzerland. Oh, dude, I'm totally jealous. Switzerland's an amazing country. Uh, since I gained more knowledge in this education, whoops, sorry, I have uh, half of the message there. Sorry, I will get to the rest of that as it comes on up. But anyway, uh, Phantom MC, uh, what's your advice, tips, tricks for good cardio workouts for Taekwondo? Because I have asthma again, I want to optimize my cardio workout. So uh, I'm assuming cardio for Taekwondo, because again, it's, it's specific. Like you don't want to make the mistake of training for non-specific for specific goals with non-specific methods. Uh, so most of the time, non-specific methods are fine for most people. When people are like, I don't know, I just want to be shaped. Okay, just do whatever. It doesn't really matter because you don't have a particular target you're going for. But it sounds like you're going for cardio for Taekwondo. So in that case, you want Taekwondo cardio. Don't go out and run a 10K because then you're going to have great cardio for running 10Ks. You're going to get in the ring and still get totally knocked down, knocked down because that's exactly what used to happen to me. So what I would do, I, I'm a big fan of just bag work. Get a timer. You know, like I'm a big fan of the gym bass, gym boss timer on your phone or something. Set it for you, you know, you know your body better than I do, but set it for an amount of time you think you can do with a challenge with that asthma. 20 seconds. Beep, go, kill, destroy that bag with everything you've got. Beep. Okay, take a rest and have a good long rest. And over time, increase the amount of time, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, a minute kind of thing, and shorten up the rest times. And that's how I would go about it. Because man, the full on bag work, if you're just going all out, that can be all the cardio you need for that. We we had a, a tournament one time and we were deconditioned for it. We did okay in the tournament uh, back in Vermont, my old school. We did pretty well, but my instructor was like, that's not gonna stand, nope. So for the next like few months, every class, it's like, break out the bags, two minutes, go. And we were just, destroyed the first time we did that and we're like oh my god it's like yeah you guys are out of shape of course and my me and my ego i'm like i'm a bike racer why is this so hard well it's a different kind of cardio you're conditioned for bike racing not for going two minute rounds non-stop so but boy that conditioned us really good in the next tournament no one could touch us no one could hold a candle to us they'd be like doubled over and breathing really hard and we'd just be like oh, okay oh is it time for the second round okay let's go kind of thing we were just dominant with it. Very effective method. That's exactly what we did. <clears throat> uh, let's see if I can't figure out this. Uh, I don't know. Uh, okay, so continuing along. Uh, education here in Switzerland, so they gain more knowledge in education. I don't know if it's just me, but I sometimes seek too much knowledge. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. So here's, here's the thing. is My approach with things is based on simplicity, but not minimalism. Okay, that's very different. Minimalism is always about less versus consumption, which is always about more. But simplicity is about understanding your objective and then going with whatever is necessary to achieve that objective. So a lot of times when it comes to knowledge and learning, we get stuck into the idea of more is always better. More knowledge, more information, more books, more, 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 more. And we just get caught on this cycle where we're just spending, spending, spending. Instead, I recommend having more of a, an objective approach, uh, an objective-based pursuit where you're like, okay, I want to learn information to learn X, to understand this single potential thing. This is the one thing I want to understand and know. And that, what that does is it frames down your knowledge. So you're still learning, but you make sure that you're consuming information towards something that you actually want. Uh, you're not going after stuff like a lot. I used to follow a lot of podcasts that were general information podcasts. You know, today, we've got this bricklayer who's going to teach us about the importance of, you know, discipline in the workforce. Oh, great. Wonderful. But after a while, I was like, what am I learning this stuff for? Like, why am I consuming this? We're taught that learning is always good, right? And which is nonsense because that's like saying eating is always good. Spending money is always good. You're just using resources that you have in finite supply of. So, we don't want to be doing it without an objective. I'm consuming information. Why? Uh, it's good for me, I guess. No. You know, I'm consuming this information. Why? Because I want to learn how to build a birdhouse. <laughs> I want to build a birdhouse. This is the information concerning how to build a birdhouse in 12 easy steps. 
right? That's what you want. So in fitness, I'm not a fan of just going on YouTube and watching people's YouTube channels and fitness podcasts and stuff like that. Instead, it's more like, all right, internet, I've got something specific I want to learn today, like how to change one's emotional orientation to things. Teach me that and specifically that. Once I know it, good, I can stop learning because I now know exactly what I came here for. Have an objective with it. And that will go a long way in weeding out a lot of the unnecessary wasteful learning. Uh, Michael Blacktree, almost 50 years old. I stopped tex testing max st lift strength because I don't want serious injury, but I still work out. I'm not ready to be old and decrepit yet. Hey, I'm in there. And it's also about uh, testing in different ways too. You know, it's what kind of things are we testing? Like the isometrics are actually still a pretty good way to test things um, as far as that max strength goes, like the isochain from Dragon Door. It's amazing how easy that is to use to test like a max strength uh, approach with even minimal warm up. It's very easy on the body. Or uh, you can have like a, how long can you hold an exercise, like a, a particular challenging thing. So lots of different ways to, to test a max. It's uh, something that we can explore in different ways. Now, Nerdy97, again, hey, if I'm a powerlifter trying to prepare for basic training, uh, should I drop the weights for calisthenics and cardio or just try and add calisthenics cardio to my routine? Well, I would add it to the routine to start off. It depends uh, kind of on your timeline here. You know, if you're going into basic training in the next two years or a year or something, like you got plenty of time, I wouldn't give up the weights right now, especially if that's something that you really enjoy doing and it, it's a part of your life and very important. I mean, if you identify as a power lifter, then I would say it's probably not something you're going to want to drop if you don't need to. Um, but military, uh, especially the new military tests, you know, they have farmer carries, they have the trap bar deadlifts and stuff. So it's still probably going to come in handy to some degree. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you've got to be well-versed in the calisthenics, not necessarily because you need to be good at them and for the military, but you, because you're going to be doing a lot of them, particularly running. That's what I would look at particularly if I were you, because you're going to be doing a lot of running and you're going to be doing a lot of rucking. So get yourself like a rucksack or something that you can use and go out on big, big hikes and do like push-ups on the ground and the hikes and stuff. That's what I would do if I were you uh, to help you prepare for the military. I can't really speak because I've never been in the military and I know the uh, basic training tests and regulations have changed, but uh, as from what I've heard from friends and their experience, that's where I would go. Let's see. <clears throat> what what else? I'm kind of, you know, I'm trying to think if I left, left, left anything out on the emotional side. But no, that's, I think I pretty much said, stated the case there. I don't want to chew your ear off too much about it. But let's get to one or more, a couple more questions here. God, I just looked at the time. I've got the timer up in the left-hand corner. I'm like, I've been doing this for like 10, 15 minutes, right? It's like, how are, geez, Lord, how the hell does an hour go by so fast? I, I'm, it's crazy to me. This is always the fastest hour of the week because I love doing this so much. Truth be told, when I was in Winter Park last week, I was literally thinking about you guys. I'm going like, I really kind of wish I was home doing my podcast right now. You know, and what we're doing is fun, but damn it, I really wish I was doing my podcast because I love doing this so much. I really do. But uh, anyway, on to a couple more. Hey, Matt, do you think that athletes look the certain way because of the sport they're in or they are in a certain sport because they look a certain way that is good for that sport? Oh, that is such an awesome, awesome question. I believe it's the former. So there, you'll probably seen this picture where it shows like two runners side by side and you got the sprinter. And he's like big and he's jacked and shredded. and He's like sprinting. And this other guy looks like an emaciated a uh, starvation victim. And he's like, this is what marathon running does for you. That's bull. It's complete nonsense. It's like, no, he doesn't look like that because he's sprinting. And that guy doesn't look like that because he's a marathon runner. He's a marathon runner because that's what his build is generally built for. And that guy's a sprinter because again, that's what he's kind of built for. And this is especially true as you get more into uh, the advanced level people in any sport. Like look at football, right? The wide receivers, skinny, wiry, shredded guys, you know, they built for speed. Look at the linebackers, like 400 pound dudes who look like they could lift up a Mack truck. Do they look like that because they're linebackers? No, I guarantee you, if you took a wide receiver and trained them like a linebacker, they'd still look like the wide receiver. This is one of the biggest myths in all of fitness. 
is that exercise is a reliable way to augment the appearance of the human body. Now, you, you, of course, you can make changes in how you look to some degree, but it's grossly overstated within our fitness culture because that's what sells. You see a picture of a model. Look at this person. They're beautiful. They're gorgeous. They're attractive. They're jacked. They're their ideal body. It has nothing to do with their diet and exercise. <laughs> if they were a complete couch potato slob, they would look different, but they wouldn't look really that different. That hot, smoking hot, number 10 supermodel, if they weren't you know, doing working out, they'd still look like a nine and a half, right? And that, that guy who's big and jacked and shredded and ripped and stuff, do you really think they look like that because of their split routine? <laughs> Absolutely not kind of thing. So that's the thing is that linebacker fell into that position because he was 240 pounds in high school. And the coach was like, dude, you're a center. <laughs> I need a guy like you to block my quarterback. That's awesome. He's like, oh, okay, coach, kind of thing. He didn't get to be that big because he played football. He plays football because he's that big kind of thing. And it's the same thing. We used to have a guy on the UVM cycling team who was built kind of like a linebacker, you know, and those guys do not make good bike racers at all. They're big, they're heavy, they're slow. And that that's just the way it is. And he did a couple of races and he's like, yep, not for me. I'm not going to be doing this. I'm going to do something else. And that's how it works. That's how it works. And by the time someone's in their position is like, are they, do they look like that because of the sport they do? No, you know, they have the body and they just kind of fell into their respective hole of where they're meant to go. And that's how it works. So that's, again, it's like build boxer abs from this routine, boxing routine. You look like a boxer. No, you won't. You look like you look now, but you'll be able to throw a better punch. <laughs> That's how it, how it works. The human body is the exercise is not a reliable way to change how the human body looks. I cover that much more in my first book, Fitness Independence. Um, I think I call it the myth of aesthetic demand or something like that. Because a lot of the message are like, do this, look this way. It's all marketing. It's all complete marketing. <clears throat> Let's see. Matt, what advice have you got for exercise being beneficial for mental illness? Oh, isn't that great? Hmm. Well, I mean, obviously there's a lot, there's two ways you can go about this. Exercise, first and foremost, can be very beneficial for mental illness. I should know. I've had a lot of mental, I would never say I've been classified with mental illness, but a lot of just hitches in my mental get along, so to speak. I have a history of it in my family. In fact, my uncle Terry had a lot of mental illness and everybody has told me since I was a kid, it's like, God, you're just like your uncle Terry. You act like him, you think like him, you behave like him. So I've got a lot of his, his uh, demons in the closet, so to speak. And as far as I could tell, exercise has basically saved my life. On the other hand, uh, anything that can be beneficial can also be abused. And that's also certainly been my case as well. So exercise can be very good for helping you deal with mental illnesses, good energy outlet, good way to process thoughts and ideas. You know, if mentally I'm in a fog and I'm like, I can't figure this damn thing out kind of thing, go out for a bike ride, go out for a hike, get a playground workout in and just let the mind process information and feel much better afterwards. So it's very good in that regard. But when we take things on a dogmatic perspective, it can become from the, uh, the uh, medicine to a poison and it can exacerbate mental illnesses, disordered eating habits, obsessive compulsive disorders with exercise and stuff, things that I have struggled with, you know, that now becomes the thing that is causing the problem, not helping it. So it's not necessarily as simple as, oh, exercise, and it's so much better for mental illness and everything like that. It can be a detrimental thing. The principle of hormesis, you know, a, a certain amount of something that's good can be the opposite effect if you have the wrong dosage. So be mindful of these sorts of things. And that's ultimately, I think, what we should close on because when it comes to our emotional orientation with things, we want to be seeking out positive benefits, positive feedback. Like I do this, I feel really good. I do that, my body feels better. I do that, it's a lot more fun. Things of that nature, we want to be like, okay, that's probably in the right direction. But when we have something like, you know, I used to go running and I used to feel really good and I'm mentally really good, but you know, you took things a little too far and now my body's achy and I get stressed out if I'm not running and I'm driving myself crazy over all the data on my Fitbit and everything like that. It's like, okay, that's a negative feedback loop. 
negative feedback, something to look at there. Something needs to change because ultimately this whole fitness thing is supposed to be a good time. You're supposed to look good or excuse me, misspoke there going on the, the thing. Yeah, they're looking good is fine, but it's supposed to be a good time. We're supposed to have fun. We're supposed to feel good emotionally about what we're doing, not negative emotions. When we feel bad about what we're doing, when we feel bad about ourselves, when we feel bad about the foods that we're eating or bad about the exercise we're doing, something's off. It's not something you should just tough through and accept. It's not something that you should just be you know, diligently powering through and a sign you're on the right track. No, it's a sign you're on the wrong track. It's a sign that you should be making changes and making something different to it because it's supposed to be overall a very positive experience for mind, body, soul, lifestyle, and everything else in between. If that's not the case, then don't be afraid to make changes. And you're the captain of your own ship on this one. So you're in charge of getting that feedback and knowing what's best for you. So I'll leave it on that one. I think that's a good one to finish it off. So Thank you very much for listening. Don't forget, folks, Mo the Wisdom app, iOS, download it and check it out. I've got a ton of shows on there already. And when you get to me on live uh, on Friday afternoons, uh, you get to literally chat with me one-on-one -on -one and we can uh, have a good time there as well. So Wisdom app, check it out, download it. And uh, there's also a lot of great stuff there as well. I've been really enjoying both making content and consuming content as well. I'll talk to you folks next week. Till then, be fit and live free.